Oscar Franklin Clark was born in Colton, California in 1919 and died in Riverside, California in 2013. The depression of the 1930s influenced Oscar to become a self-sufficient man, growing his own food and knowing how to build and fix almost anything. Oscar had enormous curiosity and became a walking encyclopedia of the natural world. He was largely a self-taught botanist, naturalist, author, and educator who taught many to appreciate the wonders of nature. He was the last naturalist, as near as I know. He was interested in everything from the stars to geology uh, to uh, botany. Um, Oscar is special because, to me, he was the John Muir, modern-day John Muir. Oscar had a passion for everything that was alive. The whole ecosystem, you know, it wasn't just the plants in the ecosystem, but the animals in the ecosystem and the geology of the ecosystem because it all was interrelated. Mm -hmm. And so he was interested in all, just not specializing in one thing and ignoring the rest. Oscar was a humanitarian at heart and he was always friendly, always willing to help. His fascination for all things natural in the world always so fascinating to work with him because he always had something new to tell you or some new observation and he, he was excited about it himself and, and I think that was just really infectious and, and helped me appreciate um, the natural world in a way that I could have you know never learned from books. And he, he looked at plants and Oscar all of a sudden goes like that. Look at, did you see this bird? Did you see this bird? Or something whizzing by a little fly he picked up. He was a very careful observer. He would, he yeah. seen things that other people didn't ever see. I discovered that he had begun his interest as a naturalist, as a young man, uh, working with Wilson Hanna, who was a noted oologist. And he and Hannah would go on field trips. Hannah would say, Oscar, uh, there's a bird nesting up in that tree. Can you go up and collect and count how many eggs are in the nest? And then later on, he asked Oscar to collect the materials that the nest was made of and help identify what those materials were. And from that initial investigative work, he became interested in botany and became an experienced botanist all on his own, that was from a very early age. Just walking anywhere with Oscar was an experience that he would never forget. I did a lot of little walks with him. We called them neighborhood walks, and Oscar was always available. Oscar was very interested in encouraging anybody who showed any interest whatsoever. If you were interested, willing to pay attention, he would give you any amount of time. I mean, he would just, he would lose track of the time of day talking to you about natural history topics. And I know for me personally, this was great. When I was getting started, um, he always had time for me. If I had unknowns, if I had things that were giving, that were puzzling me, he was more than happy to dive into it, figure it out, tear it apart, um, and tell me what he knew about it, or just tell me what it was. And he would set up a display of plants in evolutionary order from the most primitive to the most advanced. And then people would gather around and he would explain why each plant was where it was. They, he always had a large audience. People just swapped in because they were getting a lesson in botany of the world right in front of them. Oscar was fascinated with these interrelationships of the organisms that happened to live together commensally. And he could always point out to you how this plant was related to another plant genetically and phylogenetically. And he would point out the insects that fed on it and the birds that ate the seeds and scattered the seeds and so on. And he also had what I would call the, the big picture about life on Earth. He, recognized and lived his life as though everything is connected. Some of my strongest memories are of various field trips. In particular, one of my long interests has been in the flora of Mexico, and that's entirely an outgrowth of a trip that Oscar organized down to San Blas. 
it was a very interesting trip. There were three vans and about 15, 16 people crammed into them. This was December and it's a dry season in West Mexico. And so there, it, many people would just say, ah, oh, there's nothing to look at here, but not Oscar. He would stop and he would find dried fruits, seeds, a few things flowering. He'd look at just, you name it. We didn't find anything extraordinary, but it was just, Oscar knew everything there and it, he just m melted into that environment. It was so natural, even though it was, you know, where most people would think it would be just this like ugly, weedy place, but it was, Oscar made it so beautiful. He, he knew, right? he, he just started all these stories about every plant that was there and. In the Sierra Madre of Western Mexico, he picked up this little plant growing in a muddy swamp at probably 7,000 feet elevation that this collection that Oscar made was only the second known collection in history of this species. And it was the first one known with a halfway definite locality. And here Oscar got it from a definite known place. So this was kind of important. <laughs> he was very attentive to details. And that's one of the things I remember about him most strongly, which I think was a, an important thing that he imparted to me, the need for the attention to detail, to little things that tell you the story. Oscar was a medic in the Army during World War II. After the war, he became closely associated with the University of California. In the late 1940s, Dr. Frank Fasick asked Oscar to assist him in teaching a field course in botany. Because of his vast botanical knowledge, he was hired as curator of the university herbarium. He traveled extensively and was exposed to the botany of the world, leading to his well-received book on the flora of the Santa Ana River and world botany. The book is dedicated to all the young people who nurture a desire to understand the unfathomable diversity of life and to five little plants that dared to be different. He would provide the information. I, I or Marcio or Danielle would sit at the computer and type in the answers to our queries and then we would form it into the format, the final format for the book. This is the morphology of plants and it shows the key relationships of all plants on the earth, which ones came early in the development of the world and which ones came later, and why some have superior ovaries and inferior ovaries, and it's just a beautiful illustration of the morphology and relationship of various plants. And I visited him one last time to say goodbye. And he and I had a long conversation in the back room. And unlike the experience I've seen with many who are confronted with their deaths, refreshingly, Oscar was open about it. And we were able to have a very substantive conversation, not only about the meanings of life and death and our places in the universe, but the things that he took away with his life and the things that he lamented looking back over the state of affairs of science. He always looked forward, wanted to see something, learn something new, keeping up with science. Thailand has a completely different flora from what we have here in North America. And one day we were going through an ornamental garden in the town of Chantaburi and Oscar was lamenting, almost moaning. He says, Greg, it will take me a lifetime to learn all these new plants. But that was Oscar. If he had another lifetime to live, that's exactly what he would have done. <laughs>